Welcome. Very glad for such a big turnout, but not surprised given uh, given the photographers and storytellers we have on hand tonight. Um, I'm Bruce Shapiro. I direct the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, which is a project of Columbia Journalism School that is uh, devoted to uh, journalism on violence, conflict, tragedy, and their aftermath, www.dartcenter.org. We do a wide range of programs um, aimed at improving and enriching journalism on these critical subjects. Um, we are here tonight for this extraordinary program, Documentary Storytelling and Collaborative Practices. It's a conversation with uh, Nina Berman and Susan Mizellis, two photographers who, um, well, I, I'll speak personally. Uh, two photographers have had an enormous impact on my own life, my own thinking about how to tell the most difficult stories about the most difficult experiences. That's really going to be our uh, topic tonight. You know, this. The program's uh, title, Documentary Storytelling and Collaborative Practices, is a little bit of an academic mouthful. But what it translates into uh, is a conversation with these women about their two new remarkable books, uh, an autobiography of Miss Wish by Nina Berman uh, and A Room of Their Own by Susan Mazellis, um, which both document in meticulous and often imaginative visual detail um, and documentary detail um, the lives of women survivors of of extreme and intimate and deeply wounding violence uh, lives of violence and threat both of these works that we'll be discussing are genuine collaborations, which is why Collaborative Practices is in the title. Um, we'll hear more about that from Nina and Susan, but both of them collaborated with the protagonists of, of their photos and of, of their books in unusual ways. Um, and so we'll explore the meaning of collaboration with uh, highly vulnerable people, which is very unusual in journalism. In journalism, we're talking about going and getting the story, going and taking the picture. Um, these two books by Susan and Nina, these two, uh, Susan and, uh, and Nina, these extraordinary projects were really developed in a way that runs counter, that challenges a lot of the traditional journalism practices that some of us came in with. Um, so we will explore these works. We will talk a little bit about the relationship that they develop to their subjects, to their protagonists. We'll look at the ethics, at the aesthetics, the politics of these projects. Each of them will talk for about 15 minutes or so about their work. Um, we'll have a conversation among the three of us covering a bit of ground, and then a conversation with you. And I hope you'll um, think about questions that this work provokes for you. Let me say a little bit about each of them before they introduce their projects to you. Uh, Susan Mizellis, uh, <coughs> I, I will have to say I, I first came to know in the 1970s, the late 1970s, when she was a great visual chronicler of the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua um, and brought events, made events come alive that we were hearing about on the news or reading in newspapers, but had no sense of what that meant at the grassroots. And Susan's images of the falls, the fall of the uh, Somoza dictatorship, the rise of the Sandinistas, define that history for a lot of us. She received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College, her MA in visual education from Harvard. Her first major photographic essay focused on the lives uh, uh, um, uh, uh, on a sentence that is missing from my biography. Uh, but then her book, Carnival, Stri <laughs> Car Carnival Strippers, was published by Farrar, Strauss, and Jarreau in 1976. Uh, and a selection was installed in the Whitney in 
2000. She's been with Magnum Photos since 1976, and she's worked as a freelance photographer since then. Um, she's known for her coverage of the insurrection in Nicaragua, her documentation of human rights issues around the world, not only in Latin America, but in places like Kurdistan as well. Um, she's been an editor contributor to more books than I care to name. Uh, and she's also created the website uh, www.akacurtistan.com, which is an online archive of collective memory, um, which a show which traveled widely. Um, I could go on, I won't. Similarly with Nina. Um, I will say this for Nina Berman. She's my colleague here at Columbia Journalism School. She's also um, one of my oldest friends in journalism. And at the same time that I was becoming acquainted with Susan's photos through places, I suppose, like Time Magazine and wherever it was they were showing up then, I was becoming acquainted with Nino's, Nina's photos um, through work we were doing together on the south side of Chicago as students. Uh, Nina contributed to a little radical magazine called Haymarket, which lasted for a couple of years. There was, I, I didn't get down to my basement to pull out a copy today, but I distinctly remember one image that was a picture you took that was of a steel mill in uh, South Chicago where the headline was Workers Strike Against Selves. Uh, it was a supposedly employee-owned steel mill in which uh, workers did not have control as they were supposed to have and had gone on strike. Aesop. Yes, they were exactly. Aesops. They were called yes. ESOPs. That's right. <laughs> um, Nina then went on to get her master's degree here at this school. Um, she is now a uh, professor of journalism here and documentary photographer, filmmaker, author, and educator. Her wide-ranging work looks at American politics, militarism, post-violence, trauma, and resistance. Her photos and videos have been exhibited at more than 100 venues, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and Dublin Contemporary. She's the author of Purple Hearts, Back from Iraq, Portraits and Interviews with Wounded American Veterans, Homeland, an Exploration of the Militarism of American Life Post-September 11th, and most recently, an autobiography of Miss Witch, which we'll talk about tonight. Uh, her work has been widely recognized with awards and fellowships from World Press Photo, Pictures of the Year International, uh, Open Society Foundation, and others. And um, she's a member of the photography and film collective Noor Images, which she helped found. Both Susan, I, I brought Susan and Nina together, not only because their books are methodologically similar, but because so much of their work, not only these projects, is devoted to finding ways through the medium of photojournalism to show the impact of violence on individuals and on societies in many ways, shapes, and forms. From, from the explosive external violence of war to the intimate pain that follows trauma survivors um, through years and years and years. So they have much in common, some things different. We'll start, I think, with Nina, talking about an autobiography of Miss Wish, and then on to Susan. And then we'll talk a bit, and as I said, have a conversation with all of you. So. Oh, and I should add, as Nina comes up, uh, as I've already uh, said earlier, that the books, both uh, an autobiography of Miss Wish and a room of their own, are for sale in the back. So if you're minded at any point to slip out, the price of leaving early is you got to buy a book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bruce, so much. And thank you all for being here. I also want to just call out publicly two dear friends, Professor Helen Benedict at Columbia here. and. And McClintock, uh, without them for having invited me to do um, a residency a few years ago, this work never would have happened. So thank you for your support in that. In 1990, I met this girl who went by the name of Kathy Wish in London. I was a young photographer kind of looking for a story with vague ideas about photographing the end of Maggie Thatcher's time in the UK and sort of um, social issues that resulted from those economic policies. And at the time in London, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of street kids. 
and they'd roam around the West End of London, and I would wander there at night. And I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but I just wanted to meet them. And one night I came upon this girl who was banging on the door of a shelter, trying to get in. And she turned to me and she said, where are you from? And I said, New York City. And she became very interested. And we started talking. And I just began following her around. Uh, as I said, there are a whole kind of crew of kids. They'd go from shelter to shelter, soup kitchen to soup kitchen. and. I would periodically meet up with her a couple times a week and spent about three weeks there. Um, much of her days passed by trying to beg for money on the street, so she would sit, you know, primarily in the West End with her sleeping bag and occasionally with some friends. Her friend named Esther was also living out on the street. Esther had big, giant scars across both of her cheeks, and so she would try and hide her face. And Kathy was mainly collecting money so that she could buy crack, which the drug at the time in England was actually quite unusual. I mean, if you think back to 1990 in New York, those of you who we're living in the city at the time. Um, crack could be found on nearly every street corner. Uh, in England, it was difficult to s procure. It was expensive. It would take her a few days to get enough money to buy a hit of crack, and she would smoke it in a parking garage. I knew that she was frightened, and I knew that she was running for something, but I wasn't quite sure what that was. And then one day, she showed me her scars, one of her scars. She would talk about things coming on top, and she would look around, scared that people were following her. So after a few weeks, I took these pictures. I left London. I came back to New York. I gave her my phone number and my address, and she would periodically call me, collect, or send letters. And one day, she said, oh, I won a contest for homeless kids. Uh, the contest was playing piano. and." Can I come to New York and visit you? And I realize now this sounds strange and weird that I said yes to her. But actually, back in those days, people, I think, were much more open about having visitors. And, and so I said that she could. I was living in an apartment in Manhattan with my boyfriend. She came for a few days, slept on a cot. Oh, the pictures that I took in London, I pitched them to magazines, the kind of like street life of street kids in London, and no one was interested. So I just put them up in a closet somewhere. Then I saw her having a nightmare, and I took a few pictures and then stopped. And I realized that whatever she was frightened of, um, she didn't really need to be photographed. And the next day, she had this massive flashback, and she was hallucinating. She didn't know who I was. She didn't know where she, where she was. And I realized that it wasn't safe for her to be there with me, or maybe even not safe for me. And I encouraged her to go back to London and to try and get help. And I drove her to the airport. She stayed in London another two years. And she would send me letters, and then started sending me her diary entries. These were contemporaneous diaries that she was making while she was living in London that spoke to enormous violence being perpetrated on her by kind of two main characters, one named Mark, one named Sid, and her family involvement, which was unclear at the time. Kathy was adopted at age two by a white family in the south of England. And she um, was running away from them and running away from her perpetrators. Within these diaries, she also sent me hospital reports. Um, these were emergency room intake. And so I held on to them. I didn't really look at them very carefully. And then she came to New York in 1993 and has never gone back. Um, she changed her name to Kimberly Stevens. She became a ward in, of New York State. And she 
has been in various institutions ever since to try and deal with her flashbacks, her trauma, her nightmares, and her addiction. Along with her diary, she started making drawings. This is a drawing of the, her first memory of being put out as a young prostitute. And then she had drawings of a murder that she witnessed of a prostitute who was her friend. Um, I don't really like that word prostitute because it almost implies free will, but this wasn't a case of free will. This was, you know, forced sexual, this was sexual abuse for the purpose of someone to make money off of her. And she gave me these, these drawings to me. And there I would always have in whatever apartment I lived in, just a little box in my apartment of Kim's stuff. And I thought maybe one day she'll find a place and she'll want it back, or she won't want it back, and then she'll tell me to throw it out. And I never imagined making any kind of public work about what I knew about her and what I came to learn about her. I, in fact, became basically her next of kin in New York City, and all of these psychiatric and medical facilities, I would be the person that would help check her in and be the person that they would call if she tried to commit suicide or if she needed help or if they just wanted more information about her. And all through this time, she continued to collect her documents and medical reports, which is actually quite astounding. I mean, I think even if you are a person that isn't suffering from trauma, or flashbacks to try and just collect your own medical reports isn't an easy thing. But she would collect them because she was trying to build evidence of her story. Our relationship would go kind of on and off. I'd hear from her. We'd talk sometimes once a week, sometimes twice a week, and I wouldn't hear from her for a couple of months. Um, you can kind of imagine the trajectory of someone who was a crack user coming from London to New York in the early 90s. In New York, crack was basically $2 a hit. And so I could see her kind of future ahead. Um, you know, a full-blown crack addict, that, and then HIV positive. And these are all things that happened to her. And then, of course, she was arrested by the New York Police Department in 2007 and um, sent to Rikers Island for six months. <clears throat> Rikers Island, I think there's some people in this room probably who've studied Rikers Island. Um, I have to say that given the enormity of Kim's prior abuse, I mean, not only was she sort of forced out as a prostitute, but she was participated in child pornography films. She's seen multiple murders. Um, Rikers Island was a turning point for her, and the way she describes it is you know, what happened in Rikers Island was legal. All the things that happened to me before were not legal. And trying to understand how this kind of violence and daily chronic humili humiliation could happen and was legal um, still to this day confounds her. Um, she tried to commit suicide twice in Rikers Island. And I visited her, um, you know, shackled to a bed at East Elmhurst Hospital. I took these pictures of Rikers by renting a boat. You can't really see Rikers Island unless you fly over it. Cameras are not allowed on Rikers Island. They're not allowed across the bridge on Rikers Island. So the way you can see it, though, is if you rent a boat. She was arrested for minor drug possession, and she made a deal which was, if I go into treatment, um, you'll let me out. So she pled guilty. And then it took them six months to find her a place. And um, the reason why is because there is no place for someone actually in New York City who has serious psychological trauma and drug addiction. And they could not find a place that could handle her flashbacks and her addiction. She was finally just sent to a harm reduction center, harm reduction apartment. Um, these are usually tiny one-room, uh, not really apartments. They're like a little dorm in a building for HIV patients. So this, in fact, was her first apartment ever. Um, it's on West 36th Street. 
I started photo so I had stopped photographing her and then I started photographing her again when she got this apartment pretty much because I thought you know this person who's been so important in my life she might die and here I am I have no pictures of her and so I started kind of obsessively photographing her at that point and recording her and and in video and in audio to get her story down because at this point in time I mean you can see she's really really thin and I thought and this is from the HIV. Um, this is 2008-2009. This is Roosevelt Hospital, St. Luke's Hospital. So Kim started writing her own book, which was about 80 typed written pages of the story of her life. And I could spend hours getting into all the details, but it's too much really to go through. Um, and she always wanted it published. And so what happened really was me getting this residency in 2014 where I took every single bit of material between her material, right? I was the keeper of her archive, in fact, um, and my material and putting them together in some sort of narrative framework that I thought could tell the story of a woman who was trying desperately to find safe shelter, physically safe shelter and psychologically safe shelter, um, and who wanted justice. Much of her story in, in England uh, revolves around her trying to get the police to arrest her perpetrators and being stymied along the way. So what you see in the book is a mix of her work and my work. So this is one of her drawings, and this is what she writes about it. I didn't have a make-believe friend when I was young, when I was small, to tell me the best thing to do. I had this big book in mind that would flick through the pages on its own, and there would be the answer straight in front of me with a bright glow, yes or no, simple and safe, shall I run away or just stay, and whatever the answer I knew deep down that I was doing the right thing. This is her passport photograph, which I re-photographed. And then there are pictures, landscape pictures, lots of moons. She loves the moon, and she would write me notes saying, Nina, if I die, you can talk to me through the moon. And then as, as we were building this book, we started to think about pictures we wanted to do together, which was something I'd never done as a photographer before. I never sat down with a subject or a protagonist and said, hey, what picture should we make? It was always kind of my idea, and then visiting a person wherever they were and seeing if they liked that idea. Um, but we started making pictures together, so this is Central Park. And then I returned to England to revisit some locations. Um, this is a street in the West End where there was a club where she used to be pimped out of. I put my pictures and her pictures on top of my pictures. Um, she was a photo editor on this book. She met the book designer several times. Um, there's nothing in this book that she doesn't want in. Um, she, there's a part of the book where she actually explains why she wants to do it, which I think is very important. And then because her story and my account of her story would be questioned, and this, I mean, automatically would be questioned because survivors of sexual violence, their stories are always questioned. And so how do I prove it for her? How do we prove it together? And one of the ways we did this was by taking some of the medical documents, and there were, you know, enormous number of medical documents, and kind of slipping them in into the book to provide this sort of voice of authority. I went back to her small town and photographed this phone box, which was the same phone box that she used to sit in and try and call for help. So basically, before I went to England, we made a shot list. And then I would go to a place, and I'd take a picture with my phone, and I'd text it to her. And then she'd let me know if I was in the right place or not.
this is just across the street here at St. Luke's. Um, when she is put into a psychiatric facility, she immediately starts drawing. It was my job to figure out what narrative I wanted to emphasize. And what I wanted to emphasize was her humanity and love and gentleness and her desire to be acknowledged and appreciated. And so I would interview her and ask her questions about not just the bad things that were happening to her on the street, but some of the acts of kindness. And this is what she would tell me about some of the people on the subway. In the making of this book, it was really uncertain um, if she was going to survive the publication because she was, her crack habit was, I'd say, about $150 a day. And she was living mainly on the street, um, around 116th Street, 110th Street. And then um, towards the end of the book, she got into supportive housing through Housing Works and is in a much better place now. So some of the pictures, I think, are also about the loneliness and the distance between me and her. You know, when we first met, I didn't feel so separate from her experience. I mean, I knew about London life, and I was a kind of, you know, punk rock kid, and seeing kids hanging out on the street was not such a strange thing. But as our 25-year life together, you know, unfolded, and I became sort of more successful, and she became... Um, more marginalized, there was also a distance between us. And, um, and so this picture is that distance. Our communication, you know, was no longer by letters. It, we would text. And so I um, included some of our texts in the book. And then this is a selfie that she made. And um, I think that's it. Yep. So first, Nina, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for how much you shared and how, how long a process that was and how is. I assume it's continuing. Oh, yeah. Is, is <laughs> present tense. But just thinking of... Um, you know, I saw a handful of photographs on a wall at NYU mm -hmm. last summer. I still haven't seen the book. I don't have it in my hands, and yet that was such a beautiful way to enter the world, the journey. Um, you know, it's very hard in, um, to follow in some way because I think uh, trying to, um, this is such a, there's so much, there's so many different ways we can intersect, and that's what I, I love, Bruce, that you thought of that, but it also feels like a very condensed conversation. Um, I think we, uh, for me, the project that I'm going to show a bit of and not as much in um, detail, uh, originally was called Archives of Abuse. And it started, um, so I'm sharing a kind of a, I would say, a condensed process going back to 1990 when, um, 91, I was invited to come to San Francisco to work on these, this idea of, at the time, people were talking about domestic violence. It was the first time I'd heard formally people talking about domestic violence. And the challenge was, how do you bring something that's hidden to a public view? And that was the mission, really, to figure out a way to do that. So it wasn't exactly an assignment. It was just an open invitation. It came from a group called the Family um, Prevention Fund and, um, and the Liz Claiborne uh, Foundation, ironically, you know, um, selling to women, wanting women to know about other women. Um, 
so the question was how to create this public dialogue. I'm not going to show very much of that work, but it's kind of where the, the engagement for me began. And um, not quite in the same way Nina was on the streets, I was working with the people who were going into the places where things that were hidden were happening. So that was the, the logical path that felt comfortable initially was through the police. And the police were the, the ones who um, went from site to site, were called 911 for the most part. Um, and it was very evidential work, I would say. I'm not going to show a lot of this work, but just as an example, um, I was seeing, it turned out, what they were doing as well. So the police were collecting narratives, both stories from neighbors, um, people passing by, and um, then someone would make the evidential image as part of the job of these crime scenes. Um, the more I did with them over several weeks, the less I was clear about what I could do as a photographer that what they weren't doing essentially as photographers with a specific kind of mission. So what I ended up doing in this project was um, a whole series. I'm only going to show you just one um, of a woman named Irma. So I ended up integrating in collages the police reports and the photographs that the police had actually made into these collages. So we, you can't really read this, but just as an example, what it says in the yellow highlight is, stepped between and stabbed her once in the abdominal area and both attempted to stop from further attacking. Began to cut in his attempt to harm, stated that he was going to cut her throat. Um, it then goes on, but I'm not rolling. I'm not able to roll into this, the full quote. Um, so this became part of a public campaign, and it was, it was on um, bus shelter posters. For some reason, we're frozen. Whoops, there we are. Um, all over San Francisco. Um, just this poster, I made many others, but this was the one that was chosen. It protected her identity the best. Um, and my life, and, and I guess Nina alludes to this too, you know, you go someplace and then your life takes you in a different, on a different path, and can you return, and where do you return to? This is a project I really haven't, wasn't able to return to. I ended up, as Bruce mentioned, I ended up going in a totally different direction following the Onfall campaign in, in Kurdistan. And that, I do dove deep into Kurdistan and <coughs> Kurdish history, and archives of abuse has always been living there as this memory path of something that was incomplete, that felt like it never became the project that it could have and should have been. At the time, I had a lot of questions about whether or not a bus, what it mean, meant to do a bus shelter poster. I wanted, um, I didn't have the full, uh, I guess, support to do, to place the work wherever I was imagining much more radical places such as Saks Fifth Avenue and the dressing rooms so that women who never thought about the women who could well be their neighbors would kind of confront a woman who they might never meet but they might have to think about. Um, but this is in the end what that project uh, was. Uh, just last week I actually for the first time saw Irma since 1991. I had done an interview with her before we did the bus shelter posters, so she saw the idea and gave permission. But I had no idea. I haven't been to back to San Francisco, and I didn't know. I'm, I, I didn't think we'd have time for the audio, so I didn't bring it tonight. But um, it was just astounding in ways that you know are not visualized to hear her and see her running a small Filipina, she's Filipina, a restaurant in the Mission, um, not far from where this incident first occurred which her husband stabbed her, or attempted to stab her, and she grabbed the knife after he had slashed his mo her mother. Um, so the transition of the next work is the way in which I think, in a way similar but differently than Nina, of, of you know someone that you want to return to, you don't quite know when that will occur, the reaching out from, from her. For me, I think it's, it's sort of like, something living or dwelling within me that I don't know when the next expression of the work 
or the issue will come forth or there'll be an opportunity. And, and that happened in a very surprising way. I um, was invited in a, to, to uh, the northern part of the UK. Ironically, we're talking two projects that intersect there. Um, not to the streets of London, but to um, the black country. And it was from a small arts group called Multistory who invite people to the region, not so much as a residency, but just to come to find whatever they could connect to. And that's what was hardest, actually, is to land someplace where I didn't belong and had no idea of the history of. And when you read, and it's easy on Google to find stats, as it were, of course, one of the stats that came up was that one in four women in the UK will experience domestic violence in, the, in their lifetime. And these national statistics were quite striking that two women were being killed each week, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, astounding um, to have this then return in, in a sense to intersect. It became obvious, well, how would I find a place if I was going to find a place to readdress in a different way this work find another kind of entry. And I found one place amongst the 300 plus shelter services that um, are throughout the country, in the black country, that welcomed me. And I emphasize that maybe in, in reflection on what Nina's shared, because it's not just the person who you might have a relationship with you sustain in a way, but how you negotiate a different condition, which is the mediation of an institution that has to give you permission and access, and in a way is the, is the access, in the other sense, access. <laughs> the access, A-C-C-E-S-S, and A-X-I-S. And so thinking about the access, in this case, um, the conditions, of course, the constraints were no faces, no identification of the place, etc. But at the same time, some openness, and that you don't always find that with institutions. I mean, you don't have to run to Belt and go around Rikers Island or sneak. It can't be any sneakiness about it. This is a back door to a garden. But to try and figure out how to work and mediate the relationship with the institutions so it's what they want to participate in. Somewhat different experience. So in a sense, the idea was that women, they had six shelters in this particular network. Um, and the idea was to welcome women if they were so interested, not to come and tell their story, but to just come to be together. And I brought, Alex is here, she works with me in the studio, and we brought together a local illustrator, a writer. We collaborated with, I think, 14 different people. These were This was a workshop that began with a the mission of, bring, of women making soup together, thereby sitting together, thereby realizing that they actually had points of commonality, even though um, they didn't know each other. This was a workshop that was led by a, a local writer where they invited the women to imagine themselves as food. These were women who were in a refuge from very different kinds of situations. So to identify and base, imagine themselves as a kind of food, identify, self-identify, which was a, a way for her to get them interacting and um, thinking about themselves differently. So food became sort of this object to see, to smell, you know, to touch. What else would happen um, around a round table? This is Becky who, who writes, I am a piece of toast, soft and buttery, but burnt around the edges. And this is in a workshop that was maybe, what, two hours, Alex? Something like that. Um, so different kinds of approaches to try and figure out. This was with no sense that um, where was this going to lead? This was a process that I, you know, we didn't have a, a book in mind or any really defined form. Um, but this idea that women were getting together and then feeling comfortable and then wanting to come back without any obligations to participate. So a very different kind of collage, um, women wanting to imagine their futures of how they would like to live on their own 
whether or not they had the means to do that, and creating collages. Again, these were ones, these just as samples of ones that um, this was a woman named Sam who, not surprisingly, though I don't have the image here, when I went into her room much later, discovered she had something like 30 pairs of shoes decorating the walls. Um, but at this stage, I'm just, we're just sitting around tables day after day trying to create different points of intersection. Another one, which was um, an artist, a local artist who worked with us and just brought in piles of magazines and women were invited to imagine the future homes that they might like to have. So these are, you know, an example of a collage of the ideal home. Um, again, not expressing what they have, but imagining what they wanted. And then as the, we, we began to work not only in this art resource center, which was the first place, we then were relocated into one of the refuges and shelters, they call it refuge, um, which became a way to meet women in a different context. They weren't just coming to us, we were living down the hall, we were in the, in the place where they inhabited and they could come and go with different kind of frequency. And one night after a workshop, which there were days and nights, I just said, where do you live? Which room do you live in? And we went down a hall, and I followed someone into what turned out to be suite seven, that she was going to leave the next day. And this isn't the picture from suite seven, but the point about suite seven was that I suddenly saw this room as this safe place. And even though the refuge was supposed to be a safe place, this was the, it, her, her immediate reaction, there's nothing to see. There's nothing here. And of course, that in a way, in a different way maybe than, you know, something that it triggers an idea. And I, I started to feel these rooms to be mirrors and reflections of the state of mind that they were in. And without having them present, through their absence, they were present. And that's, I was, that's kind of became the metaphor for the project. Um, the room really became a kind of representation, in a way, of that moment in time that they couldn't imagine themselves beyond. That was just this slice of time. It could have been a day, it could have been a year. They are free to stay as long as they need. So we kind of did something I'd never quite done. I mean, yes, when I was in Nicaragua, I processed black and white content, uh, black and white film to be able to send up contact sheets with color film and in the late 70s. But this was setting up shop, and you see Alex in the back on the right, and Lexi, who's now in San Francisco, and we set up in our hotel room, and every night we would come back and look at what collages had been made, what interviews had been generated, begin to transcribe them, bring photographs back the next day, and a different kind of process of inclusion that was really within a very short cycle, not knowing even when they were going to leave. Um, so this idea of returning to the subject wasn't abstract. It was that we might never see them again if we didn't. It was a lot of rotation and transience. So this is a room just in the shelter. They gave us a room. We began to piece together. You can kind of see photographs of rooms and transcriptions. And sometimes the idea of this arch, we began to feel that there was a narrative that began with coming into a space, which was an emergency room, with apps, every, every shelter had an emergency room, but there was nothing else. And then slowly there would be a beginning to sense of life. And I always wondered whether having nothing meant that they didn't want to stay or whether or not, you know, the something meant that they were going to be there for a long time. Um, so they were beginning to see how we were kind of interacting from what they had given us, what, what they could see themselves being portrayed with. Um, you know, when we moved towards the book, it, it was a different stage. And one of the things that I was here at Columbia, I guess about a year ago with Marianne's, I don't remember, but I think it's about a year ago, and I was completely paranoid to talk about this project because we were on the cusp to keep a story really short so we can get to the richness of the conversation between us. Um, I was on the cusp, and we had sent PDFs continuously as... Alex really was designing this project in-house. We were looking and changing and adapting, and we were constantly uploading 
and sharing the, the kind of where we were with bringing all this material together. And on the cusp, um, and literally the cusp, on a Friday, I think I spoke on a Thursday night, and we were supposed to go to press on Friday. And the designer who was in charge of sending the files out um, urgently had a death in his family, which meant that he couldn't send the files on Friday. Thursday night, the institution said, you can't represent this place, anonymous for the moment, um, which of course was every, every woman we had interviewed talked about this place. The place is now allowed to be talked about, which is all the more ironic, called The Haven. It's interesting to think maybe levels of participation, people's understanding of what it is you're doing and seeing themselves and feeling as open as they were to welcome us, they then froze in fear of what it was going to look like to a public that they had participated in the project, but they felt incredibly vulnerable to how, at the time, that in the UK they were slashing public funds by 50%. So this is an institution that has, has, feels that they are there to protect. Um, obviously, this, this is a, CCT, a CCTV. It's, they're always looking outwards. They're always looking inwards. Many of the women felt this constant surveillance, which they speak openly about. So of course, the institution reading that became more paranoid about what, were they doing the right thing on behalf of the women. They almost closed down the project. Uh, I have to say it was really a shock to us. This is an example of an, an early arrival to the refuge. So this idea that they were, a, they were there was so powerful and so important that they survive to us. We thought what we were doing was in complete harmony. Um, so I think it's, um, that's another thing we can maybe touch on. Um, but this idea of making a room your own was the theme, the narrative, the arc, starting with nothing. Progressively in the book, you feel women beginning to be there, be there for their children, create a home, even though it's not a home, it's a temporary home. So each room is like a life at a certain, inter you know, interrupted life almost, pulled up, the roots pulled up, and they have what they have. Um, you know, Janet only talked about the pink she wanted her daughter to be. Everything would be pink. Um, and, and some of the work was also contending with just the aloneness in a collective space, which was supposed to be for women, by women for women. Um, and their relationships were so uh, fragile and tentative, but not necessarily open to each other. Um, very different backgrounds, very diverse ethnically. Um, some women who had suffered physical abuse, others more emotional, arranged marriages, quite a lot from Southeast Asia. So my question was trying to have a way, and it's interesting you talked about reenactment in a way, or partnering. In a sense, this is a partnering, though I wouldn't have quite put it that way, um, because Tia just went out into the garden, but she chose to put on a wig. And I wasn't even thinking about really making a picture. I wasn't sure. So it's that in-between moment in which She's thinking, she's out in a space, and I'm seeing her in the space, and I'm seeing that this, this is okay, this is a safe space, you know, and how you find that safe space, which sometimes I feel is actually more magical than intentional for me. It was a discovery, and then it became a place where the women could participate differently than they had. And so in this arch, we move from the absence to the beginning to feel presence of women in their spaces and very much through the stories of what they feel comfortable sharing. And it's not at anything like the depth of Miss Fish, as it were, but, you know, because they're, they're much more guarded, I would say. Um, Tilak is the one woman who was just extraordinary, extraordinarily articulate. And the, the big moment for us is this, this moment where she shared her diary, and she shared a diary that was very extensive, but of course way too revealing. And what she ended up, and we ended up deciding, was that the one place that she could share would be to share with any woman who would pick this book up. And so she uh, 
shared part of a diary that comes from something called the Freedom Program, which is what all the women in this shelter go through at some point, several days, kind of like the old tea therapy, um, being around in a circle, talking about the abuse and talking about why did they create the space they did for the men to do what they did and revisiting those relationships. So this is a tiny diary you see here of Tilak, and you can take it out of the book. And when you hold it, and our goal was that when other women hold it, they start to ask the same kinds of questions about whatever kinds of relationships they are, about the power dy dynamics in those relationships. Um, so that's just the trace of the process. The thing that I found particularly interesting about the shelter is, of course, some women stay shorter and longer time. Some come back and mentor others. Some move on, and when they move on, they move out of circuit, and there's total disconnect. The shelter never knows anything more about them. So those life cycles, constantly transient. Um, this is Fran, who wanted us to see her new home, wanted us to know that she had cut off her relationships finally with her ex-partner. So the book tries to move through this cycle um, and, you know, I'm really just going to show a tiny more clip because I think the conversation is probably the richest part of this evening. Um, we don't need, oh, I wanted to show it without sound, but I figured out how to do that. Sorry. Um, anyway, it's just the way in which we look at a book that we make. Um, and who else looks at a book, and what are we making, who are we making a book for, ultimately? Not only with, but for, to capture, you know, what's essentially a private world with, I would say, authentic voices, but nonetheless a very different experience than, than they might otherwise have. So I would, as much as I would love to see Miss Fish with her book, um, I'm going to show quickly um, Tillock receiving the book. At the same time, in the institution, um, and of course, she's looking just for one thing. Where am I? <laughs> so unlike the whole autobiography, Tilak is just a few pages. And she's not really interested in anyone else. <laughs> so I kind of think those are interesting resonances for us to work off of. I mean. Is that me? Yes. Only I can come up with stuff like that. She draws the various rooms in the shelter that she's oh, been in. Oh, dear. Another room. Roommate. Okay. Freedom program. You've got that in there as well. It's amazing. I hate my husband. That was a needle. Because <laughs> I sure don't. <laughs> this is my bedding, but it's not my room. So we so rarely um, complete the circle in our work, you know, bringing something back in a meaningful way to someone that's participated to whatever degree. Um, I still believe that Tillock will make right someday, I hope, the, the biography of the places she has been in because she is kind of like the room and the room is she sees, she's, she's seen people come in and out of rooms and she's, she called herself the resident spy because she was constantly paying attention to what, every, what was happening to everyone else as well as herself. Um, but, you know, this idea that you try to, in some way, make visible what's been gifted and return what has become, through you, a link back to others. So I'll end there. Thank you both. I, you know, I think of both of you as, as people who have been my teachers. You've taught me how to look. And I think with both of these projects, you're teaching r the reader how to look at 
stuff that either, as you quoted one of the women saying, well, there's nothing, there's nothing here. And as, as journalists, we often go into a room and say, well, 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 but there's no story here, or there's no person here, or there's no image here. Um, or, as with Miss Wish, you're, in both cases, you're helping us to find ways of looking at things we'd rather not look at and we'd rather not know about. And I, um, we'll talk more about looking and visuals in, in a few minutes, but let me ask you one thing for starters. There was, you both described a lot of the collaborative steps that you took, and I think a lot of the younger reporters here are thinking about how, how to win the trust of folks, how to deal with, uh, in depth with people who have suffered a lot or who are very vulnerable or at real risk. And you talked a lot about the different steps you took to protect folks. But what are the outer limits of collaboration? As, as professionals on these projects, where do you, what are your boundaries? How do you define them? How do you maintain them? How do you ensure the, the journalistic integrity of it? at the same time that you're giving a lot of ground and drawing people into the process. Nina, do you want to think about that a little? Well, I think um, this book is quite unusual because um, I don't really see it in a conventional journalistic way. I mean, the boundaries that are taught at the school, you know, don't support people financially, don't care for them. I mean, these were all broken because it, it, it wasn't a journalist project for me. I mean, except the few weeks in London it was, and then it became something else. But, but um, I will say that I've talked to Kim about this because she met other journalists a long, long time ago, and we did an interview for sort of module that's going to be used to teach journalism students about how to report on um, mental illness and trauma. And what she said was she wishes that the journalists that would come in for a quick period of time um, would actually, a few months later, just drop a line and say, how's it going? And not, I think maybe sometimes journalists fear that the subject or the source is going to then become very demanding, and so maybe they stay away. But just to sort of drop just a nice note, or how did it go, and, you know, the story came out, and, and but just checking in to say hello, and, and not for a transactional purpose, mm -hmm. but just as, and the way Kim described it to me is that she, she had a really bad feeling, as did the kids in London on the street, about journalists because they felt that it was very predatory. Um, so I would suggest that. Um, yeah. yeah, though you can't really impose that because it has to come from a place where you really are curious to know. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, what would have happened if she hadn't reached out? It would have been a story that might or might not have been published, you know. Sure. So it's this stepping towards on both sides, you know, and yeah. I think that's so special in that. In that's in what you, what you've been able to do, but I, I think you should talk, Bruce. I'm not teaching here. You guys are teaching here. <laughs> uh, I never understand teaching you're, that. You are ethic. temporarily commissioned here. This is <laughs> well, but that that ethic of do not return, do not speak the language, do not get involved, do not connect. I hope that's not what we're teaching here. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, photography, because you can't I think really that's teach where the that. real place begins. Yeah. I just, you know, how... But, but, I mean, given that, I mean, and given, you know, both of you have these profound commitments that you articulated very clearly to a very a distinct kind of mm -hmm. process. So, you know, when you were negotiating with the refuge, for example, what were some of the prerogatives that you felt you had to maintain? The outer limits of here, I... It was not, that was why it was so shocking. And I think when I was here, I was probably yeah. still stunned. And you were at that session. Um, they were completely open with us through the process. There was absolutely no, yeah. other than no identification, which I understood completely. It was, but the, what was shocking is that after, what, a year and a half of in interactions, they suddenly panicked. Mm -hmm. I think that can happen with any subject, actually, that mm -hmm. they start to see how they're being seen, mm -hmm. and that's a shift point. And then I also think we over, um, 
we try to think about how they might feel when they are seen mm -hmm. in settings that we don't control. And so therefore we can't know how they're seen or they're understood. I mean, that goes yeah. back for me with carnival strippers where yeah. people perceive the women very differently than I felt about them and felt about their determination to shape their lives and all kinds of other issues. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that the institutional um, protectiveness um, is different than the, the best of what they created mm -hmm. was the space for the exploration yeah. for those women. And then they overprotected, almost victimizing the women in that mm -hmm. process, yeah. ironically. And that really, I think we talked about that yeah. even a year ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, they almost right. could have destroyed the fact that this project would have moved it, forward. Um, one of the other things that struck me watching your presentations was how much, even more in the presentations than in the, in the physical books, how much, f how many fragments of documents and fragments of images and fragments of memory mm. play in both of mm. your projects. And I, someone who thinks a little bit about trauma, one of, one of the characteristics certainly of traumatic memories, fragmentation, it's something that you see a lot. As storytellers, how did you kind of think about bringing, why did you think about bringing fragments in, and how did you balance that, the complexity that it brings with the terrible incoherence, that, you know, the collage that goes completely crazy and makes, you, makes a story incoherent? I mean, yeah, well, we did about 15 different versions of the book to yeah. dealing with that precise problem, is how do you bring some kind of cohesion to all of the fragments and all of the different mediums and drawings, documents, texts, um, her writings, you know, um, my pictures. And in the end, I mean, I, th I think that what we decided was, one, the reader shouldn't have an easy time. And I think that that's an important um, point to stress is that the story is very deep and dark and complex, and there's no reason why someone should be able to understand it in a minute or two minutes. And um, it, you can't reduce it to a soundbite or to one picture. Mm -hmm. So once we kind of accepted that, then it was, what was the storyline through? And one of the things we did was we realized that the archive itself was an important aspect of the story, but we couldn't put every single document in there. So, I mean, we called it down, but then we, we printed the documents on a different kind of paper. With the idea that a reader could go through it, and if they wanted to go in and get into the documents, they could, and then they could also pass them by, and um, or maybe come back to it. And so it kind of um, allows the reader to determine their level of engagement. But it, I mean, it took us two years. How did you think mm -hmm. about the documentary elements for Room of Their Own? Yeah, you know, I think we were thinking about turning, because it's not a single narrative, yeah. which go, right. the mm -hmm. difference of the fragments of the materiality of it is different than the fragments of the storytelling. Yeah. So I think I was thinking it's sort of like dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, dash, where can the pauses be, where can mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. how can you build a progressive mm -hmm feeling that people want to turn the pages. So it's not as dark in one sense. It's not heavy. It's hopefully inviting someone to want to turn the pages and make different kinds of discoveries without feel, being confronted right immediately with the hardest yeah. moments, you know, and also which stories. I mean, you know, Alex is here and she could uh, talk about this as well. We edited extensively these transcriptions and some of them ended up with very little even though they had been very long because it added just a little bit more imagining a reader ready for a little bit more but not too much and so that's that's a linear reading of a book that we all know no one does I mean when you see Tillock going where am I that's all she did I see in bookstores and probably right here in the back somebody flipping from the back of a book and you've carefully tried to create a so-called <laughs> linear experience which is destroyed in a second because people don't have patience, as you said. So we were trying to bring, bring people in at a pace where we thought they might consider trying to place themselves into that reality. 
What about, and here, Susan, maybe you can go first, and then Nina, how did, visually now, and then we'll, we'll go to the room, but let me ask you a visual question. How do you, how do you balance the, the need to, to document the hardest parts of these people's lives and the, the difficult elements, even an empty room can be very unsettling. Mm -hmm. With that need to, if not seduce, at least make bearable. I mean, you talked a little bit about it, about the rhythm, about interspersing documents and other mm -hmm. things to break it up. What about even in choosing images or framing images? How? What are the outer boundaries of the bearable as you mm -hmm. thought about it in this? Hmm. Gee, I'm not sure how to respond to that. There was one woman, um, I'm looking at Alex to think we would probably feel that there was a woman named Anne who was clearly traumatized to the point that every time she told her story, she told a different story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that was an example. In this particular configuration, we tried to capture some part of what Anne could convey mm -hmm. without getting into the entanglement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you see it when you see her life drawing, which was this, again, the woman we worked with loved hearing their life drawings and helping them stretch out like a tree yes. across the page, branches she's of got, parts. She's got that very complex And she one. has yeah. that unbelievably yeah. complex. And <clears throat> every time we talked to her, there was a different version of what had happened in her life. Hmm. So trying to create a form where if you want to understand how distorted her world was, you can kind of try and find, piece it together, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle almost. Yeah. And, and you know, like, you know, there must have been some images that you, you or Kim thought would be too hard for the reader, or some that might have been too hard for her or you. I don't know. How did you... What were the, 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 the visual ways of balancing the mm -hmm. darkness of the story with the need for bearability? And well, I think there are a couple of things. One, um, so a lot of this book is about addiction, but you only see one or two pictures of her actually using drugs. And that was an intentional decision. Um, I could have spent any night at any day with her in a crack house on Lenox Avenue, but I did not want to, and it's not because she wouldn't have allowed me. It's that, one, I didn't want to see it, and two, I saw no reason to publish those pictures. And I think what you don't shoot is mm. as important a conversation as what you do shoot, and this is despite, I mean, most people talk about not shooting things because they're not allowed to shoot them or not being given access, but I chose not to shoot them because I did not want to further stigmatize her or have that story to be about, oh yeah, look, she's smoking crack again. Um, so that's one answer to your question. The other answer to your question was there was a picture I really liked taken on Amsterdam Avenue in 110th. She's smoking a cigarette. The sky is like purplish gray and there's um, the cathedral church. And for her, it brought back very creepy, scary memories from England, which I didn't see at all in the picture. But for her, it did. So that picture was deleted yeah. from the book. Mm -hmm. And um, But beyond that, um, I think we were just pacing her drawings, because those are the brutal images, and just trying to find a way to pace them in the layout. So let's do a few questions from the room. Just come up to the mic. Um, and uh, this is being videotaped, so don't do anything that would embarrass your grandmother or whoever else is going to see this, or your grandchildren for that matter. Um, surely there's someone who has something to ask. If not, I'll kind of keep going. But mm -hmm. room full of smart people, a couple of really smart photographers. Yeah. Oh, Mary Marshall. Yeah, just go up to the mic. Thank you. Uh, thank both of you for such incredibly brave work. It's honestly just so inspiring. I have so much to say about that, but I'll say it to you personally. So Susan, I was um, 
I was very interested in the last person that you talked about and the very complicated mappings. And it strikes me, while I'm in the field of oral history, that we deal with multiple narratives all the time, but um, and mostly from different people, but sometimes from within. You know, people can't remember a story the same way one year they remember it another. But it seems to me it's also could map a form of dissociation, just dis extreme dissociation, mm -hmm. in which which is not uncommon with severe trauma, in which she's literally unable to remember it coherently. And I don't know if, if that. It, it wasn't, I mean, Alex might remember this differently, but I don't think it was about coherence. I wasn't looking for coherence. It was that she reported on something that others said never happened. And so try to, oh, how do you figure out how to represent, and it was about the death of her daughter uh -huh. under particular I circumstances, see. a very, very horrific story, mm -hmm. particularly horrific. Yeah. And, yeah. and actually, that reminds me, Nina, one thing you talked a little bit about in the book but didn't quite get to here was some of the verification that you mm -hmm. did. So okay. you, mm -hmm. to figure out what's real and what's not, mm -hmm. how would you, how'd you do that? So um, I spoke with counselors here in New York that treated her. I went back to England and spoke with social workers that treated her there. Um, I did interview her parents in 2009, but it was at a time where I wasn't really sure of their story, um, but the mother told me a version that makes a lot of sense up to a point. Um, but then spending, you know, seven days going through all the materials, I started piecing the puzzle together and found visual verification yeah. of, um, yeah, of of enough of her story that I felt confident to be able to embark on the project. And then also, unlike um, Susan's example, uh, Kim's story has never changed. So there are certain situ you know, events in her lifetime that over 27 years she has stuck to that story and been able to describe them very carefully. Mm. Yeah. Marianne. Again, thank you for this amazing presentations. Um, it strikes me. One thing that I see in both of your work that I think is so extraordinary is the combination of kind of closeness and distance. And I was so glad you showed that picture on the 110th Street station in the subway and about, that was about distance and also loneliness within relationship. Um, and I was so struck by the way both of you held back mm -hmm. in not sensationalizing any of these stories that are so sensational, actually, that, could have, that any other journalist might have so easily, or writer or photographer might have so easily sensational, uh, pro, you know, sort of pushed toward sensation. So I was wondering how you think about reticence and distance within relationship, because especially in Susan's story, where, which wasn't such a long-term relationship as Nina's was, you want to est establish a relationship. You want to get to know people so that you can share their stories, but at the same time, you're holding back uh, so much, and neither of you actually told a lot of details about these horrific stories of abuse, and yet, were so um, we were so touched by them through illusion and not through um, revelation or exposure. Mm -hmm. Take a shot. <laughs> you know, I had an answer in my head and then it just disappeared. Um, I'll give you one space, a little bit of space, because I think that's so beautifully. Um, uh, so important mm -hmm. what you just said about you know this this navigation of closeness and distance and um, not the physical distance but the act of distancing, which is a little bit different. Um, the acknowledgement of the inevitable distance, um, finding the appropriate distance, which I think is a very intuitive process. Um, you know, I, I mean, as simple a photograph as it might seem to be to enter a room, which was the most private domain someone had, the only thing they had, to feel that, and the amount of time I could be there. I mean, you know, Alex knows, but, you know, it would be, I might be there for an hour and only make one frame. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like you walk in and you say, can I just get that picture? It's, it's a whole different 
space to establish. So it's a very intuitive sense of distance. And of course, um, I mean, I've seen Tilak again since the, giving her the book. I mean, knowing her progress is very different than getting, somehow getting emails isn't quite as satisfying. Um, <laughs> You know, though I can feel that in your book, that each time you got that, it was an action, you know, to invite you back into the relationship. I'm not quite sure what the emails from Tilak are. I just love that she's now in a different kind of residency, and she wants me to know she's moving on. Well, um, I would, I was very nervous about asking Kim details of certain events in her life because I was frightened that this might trigger something and that the conversation would end up being harmful to her. And so it used to be a joke, actually, that we would have because I became like the worrying mother. And she would be like, it's OK, Nina. Like, I'm <laughs> fine. I can talk about it. But that didn't stop me from always asking that. And I, I feel better that I was always asking that, even if it got to be a bit, you know, irritating for her because I wanted to make sure that she wanted to talk about it. And I mean, we have a very different kind of relationship that is typical of, you know, documentarian and, and subject, but still these, these issues do come up. And um, also I would, I required actually um, another joke that we had. I said, Kim, I want to make sure you are full on and want to do this, so you need to write down for me why you want to do this. And, and she wrote three pages. And th those three pages are so meaningful to me because I can look back and I can say, did we accomplish what she needed and what she wanted? And um, I really suggest um, students to do that when they're doing a kind of deep reporting, ask the person, what do they want? Why are they participating with you? Why are they talking to you? And have them write it down so that you can, you can refer and they can refer too. Um, hi. Uh, hi, Nina. Hi, Susan. Hey, Mary. <laughs> hi hey. there. Um, I, I'm a historian of photography, mm -hmm. especially of photojournalism, and these are two of my favorite photographers, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> But I was really struck, and this is sort of following up on what you just said, Nina, because in order to ask for those pages, you yourself have to be present, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you, and I was struck in the contrast between these two projects, mm -hmm. and I haven't seen the book, so I don't know how they came out, but that Susan seemed to be um, uncertain or searching for or not as fully confident in her relationship to her subjects. You know, I mean, who are you in relationship to this project? And that is something that I didn't feel as clearly as I did with this project. I mean, it, they're not comparisons are odious, and that's, I'm not saying bad or good. I'm just saying there was a striking difference here. And, sure. um, that's the time. And oh, of course. People. No, I, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I, I'm not pretending it was other than what it was. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how long the relationships, I mean, relationships are very complicated over time. But, but um, then how this, were one you of the motivated? Hardest, and, yeah, sorry? What motivated you, deeply motivated um, you to be there? Oh, you couldn't be there and not be there. Right. The question is what being there could be for them, mm -hmm. which is something else. So, you know, Nina's story begins being on a street, seeing a bunch of kids, kind of being curious about someone, not knowing at the time. I mean, just the being there is that first mm -hmm. being there. And you don't know when you're doing work. This is the difference of a historian who looks at stuff who's not in the making of stuff in a different way, comes at it from a different angle. Because you don't, I don't, in my, my knowing of work, 
where work will lead. I mean, the reason I, I showed a very short snapshot of archives of abuse, but it, it, it resonated for 25 years that somewhere something has been happening that I don't know more about. So it opens up a new channel. And, and that's different than having a relationship that you follow over time and you is revealed over time. I mean, when I was looking at, and, and I didn't know about this project um, from Nina until I saw a few photographs, and that didn't do it. I mean, you haven't talked about the design of the book and yeah. collaborating in this way, but Ken Klitsch, for example, the story of Beth, the book of Beth, is an extraordinary relationship over three decades. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eugene Richardson exploding in life with Dory. I mean, these are different kinds of relationships, so they sh they're not really comparable. I mean, that's... But, it's still, but they're still relationships of trust, and I think Yes, that's in some ways it's harder to have trust in a shorter time than have yeah. trust that's yeah. earned over a longer time. But the hardest thing for us, and I, I, I'd love Alex to participate, was my uh, going back within less than, maybe it was two months after bringing the work together, and three quarters of the women that I'd met were gone. Hmm. So that was good, <laughs> but at, at the same time, challenging. I mean, that was true for me when I was working with carnival strippers from one week weekend to the next. You begin a conversation, you begin a relationship, you have no idea it will, if it will last, if it'll be meaningful to them as much as it is perhaps to you. You can't control that, and that's what the gift to Nina is the reaching back to Nina. Nina, I don't know if Nina would have ever been able to find her if she hadn't reached out to you. Well, she ran away from England to New York because I was here. But and that's I was what her I mean. safe. Yeah. I and she reached out to you, but if you had said, gee, I'd love to find that oh, woman. Oh, no way. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So I think that's a very special yeah. extension you know, of, from someone to reach out to you and it could also have been rejected. And what the beauty is that, to me, about Nina being open to that process, not knowing where it's going to take her either. So we all know the dark places that our best friends can take us <laughs> also, you know, and not be able to do very much with for how those kinds of limits, you know. So the fact that you responded and were there for her. Do one more question. And then we'll have to wrap. Yes, thank you very much for this lovely presentation. I wanted to ask both of you that um, obviously in these two projects there is a, a longevity and um, there is a relationship being built specifically with you and Kim and for yourself with the group in the house even though you're not allowed to show them. Um, and there is a distinct effort not to other these characters, mm -hmm. um, which seems possible when you're spending that much time with someone. How would you translate that refraining and holding back from exotifying or othering um, other, um, in other situations where, for example, where you have to, how would photographers do that? Because when you have to go in into a situation where, say, women have been traumatized, maybe raped in war or whatever, how can you tell the story, take photographs, but keep the boundaries and not other? Can you try and describe that? Well, I think it's, I mean, a super important question and very um, sort of accurately presented. It's something that students wrestle with all the time. Um, what I tell them is, first, you have to listen before you take any pictures. You have to listen and see what people are telling you. And then you have to really question your own motivation. Why are you there? And, um, and see if your motivation is authentic, actually, and um, is open enough so that that person will want to trust you and share their story. And then I don't think that photographs are enough alone, personally. And so when I've done other projects, I try to incorporate what people are saying and without my interpretation, but just some lines of what they're saying so that they have some agency to go with the picture. 
and um, yeah, and going very open. Susan, thoughts on that? How can I say beyond ditto? I mean, you know, the, what she said. Yes. I think what <laughs> Nina said is the the heart of it. I mean, um, but it does start with acknowledging someone else is other. <laughs> it could be you, my best friend, mm -hmm. or them, as it were. The the us them, the the I thou. I mean, you know, it begins there. And the question is only, does one want to bridge out from what? we know of ourselves to anyone else. It has to start, and that goes back to your point of authenticity. It has to be real, and people know if it's not real. Yeah, They just know. You're either really a listener or you're not. You want, you want a, that quote, you know, speaking to whatever journalist might be in the room. You just want what you need. Mm -hmm. And if you start there, you go nowhere. So it's not about what you need, it's about Something, some part of yourself that opens to a place of discovery that is not about what you know. And it's about really wanting to know. And that's everyone knows if you're really listening. I have to say that as a reporter, I, as a word person who's a terrible photographer, um, I learned much more about how to listen from photographers than I ever did from other reporters. And um, maybe it's because you guys are already having to overcome the distance that comes with gear, the distance that comes with mm -hmm. intimidation of making pictures. I, I'm not quite sure why, but as I certainly, as I think back on, on colleagues I worked with, the lessons in listening that mm -hmm. came mm -hmm. from the kind of photographers who make humane and memorable images is it's different from reporters who come in knowing what the story is that we want to get or the quote that we want to get it's a different it's, kind of receptivity uh, well, not that every photographer under the best, under the that best way, but, yeah i yeah. was going to say under the best yeah. conditions but too often and it's a different journalistic climate certainly but it's too often the pressure to get not what you want, but what somebody else needs or thinks they need and want from you. Let's be honest. You know, that, I mean, any of you who have been in the field or haven't yet been able mm -hmm. to be in the field, right. because nobody will even give you the time to be in the field anymore. Uh, you know, um, I mean, I just was working on a very short, in a very short and in, intense piece for, for a week, and there were no funds to bring the writer. They were investing in me doing the reporting and that I was going to tell the story and have it be rewritten. That is just exactly opposite to the way the best conditions to work, with two people listening in different ways, with different kinds of eyes and ears. That's the ideal. And it's, it's very rare now. It's extremely rare. All right. And we're, we're going to have to stop, but the conversation can go on informally. Let me say several important things that I have to do. First of all, um, buy books. They're in the back, um, and, and I believe there are little funny machines that take credit cards there, so, you know, you can buy books. Secondly, um, I failed to say at the outset and in the middle, and so I'll say it now, uh, a note of thanks to our co-sponsor for this event, the uh, Reframing Gender Violence Working Group, which brings colleagues across the Columbia campus and across disciplines together to talk about in, um, gender violence and ways of dealing with it. And that actually is how I first encountered Susan's project last year at an informal presentation where she talked about some of the challenges that she fleshed out uh, in this talk. Um, I want to thank both of you. And another thing that struck me watching the work this time is that they, this is, these are, what, another thing these projects have in common is that they, invite us into three different time planes at the same time that like trauma itself these are photos that collapse time there is the the real time in which you're taking your images and capturing what's going on there is the the traumatic the violent the horrific memory that's in the background of every single image in these books for all practical purposes, there's a, a backstory that is 
alluded to, referred to, documented, or not, or is completely invisible, but somehow these photos make memory visible. And then there is the present time of the viewer, the reader, the downloader. We have to negotiate our own responses to these images and to these difficult memories that are present. And you're doing a, a great service in elevating the, the presence of the long aftermath of trauma in both of these books. Thank you very much, Nina and Susan. Thank you.